Hello, everyone, and welcome to NIFI's ninth webinar on metrics and evaluation for firm incubators. My name is Eva Angela Winter, and I'm the National Technical Assistance Coordinator for the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. Um, we're the ones who are bringing you this webinar today. Um, we have been uh, in operation as a farm incubator since 1998, and we're very excited to um, provide this information. So, Metrics and evaluation for farm incubators is a big issue for all of the projects that NIFI works with. And our webinar today is a continuation of a conversation that's been taking place at our field schools, on other webinars, and on the NIFI listserv over the past two years. And it will continue to be a focus for NIFI in the future. Hopefully, after this event, you'll have a few more ideas and tools up your sleeve that either start or continue to develop the evaluations you do within your programs. As always, we would like to thank our sponsor, the Cedar Tree Foundation, for making this event and the NIFI program possible, as well as our presenters from the University of Vermont New Farmer Project, the Intervale Center, and the Agriculture and Land Based Training Association. Here's our agenda for the next hour and a half. I'll talk for a couple minutes first about NIFI, and then we'll move into our presentation. Um, first, Jesse Schmidt from the University of Vermont New Farmer Project will give us an overview of their excellent web assessment tool. Following that, Maggie Donan from the Intervale Center and Chris Brown and Kaylee Grimland from ALBA will each talk about how two of the longest running farm incubator projects in the country handle assessments with their farmers and how they utilize that data. And then I'll talk for a bit about NIFI's new resource, the Metrics and Evaluation Toolkit for Farm Incubators, which we'll be launching this week. We'll have about 20 minutes for questions from you at the end of the presentation, so you'll be able to ask about specific issues related to your individual projects. So now I'm going to talk for a minute or two about NIFI. I know many of you are familiar with this information, so I will keep it very brief. At the end of 2011, New Entry received funding to provide training and technical assistance to startup incubator projects across the country. You can see here our map of incubator projects that have sprung up in the recent past. We have about 125 projects on this map now, which you can find on our website. And many of these projects have shared challenges, and New Entry and various other partners have come together to address the increasing requests for training and technical assistance around these shared topics of interest. As you know, we offer uh, webinars like the one you're currently doing. So, like I said, this is our ninth webinar, and all of our previous webinars are available to view for free on our website. We also offer a referral service for you to receive free one-on-one -on -one mentoring and technical assistance from our project partners, who are shown here. So ALBA, New Entry, the Intervale, the Minnesota Food Association, and um, NASAP, the New American Sustainable Agriculture Project. And you can contact me directly if you're interested in receiving technical assistance. As of now, NIFI has provided over 175 hours of technical assistance to 58 organizations throughout the U.S. and Canada. We've now had two national in-person field schools that have brought together dozens of organizations to share and learn from each other. And I'm happy to announce that our third field school will be happening at the Headwaters Incubator Project that's outside of Portland, Oregon this coming fall. As for online resources, we do have an excellent and relatively low volume but high quality listserv, which anyone can sign up for on our website. And um, we're very proud of our training materials, our online searchable database of over 150 documents, which includes sample curricula, manuals, forms, case studies, all available for free download. And we have also released a comprehensive farming data toolkit in September of this past year, which has now been downloaded well over 350 times. So there's a lot of great information in there, and I definitely encourage you to take a look at that resource if you haven't already. Great. Now I'm going to turn things over to Jesse Schmidt from the University of Vermont's New Farmer Project to talk about their web assessment tool. Um, go ahead, Jesse, take it away. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so uh, in my work for UVM Extension, I help coordinate the Vermont New Farmer Project, um, which is a, a BFRDP-funded project we got going in 2011, and our uh, program was to help develop regional uh, resources and services for new farmers. Um, so these are our project partners. Some of them work statewide, some of them are working regionally, and we've all been working together to offer technical assistance to people who are starting or expanding uh, their new farms. 
So here in Vermont, we work with all different kinds of farms, um, from direct market to wholesale, one person to multiple employees, you know, livestock, produce, value added, uh, you name it, we probably have it here in Vermont. And we also work with uh, all kinds of farmers. I'm sure you guys experience this as well. We have a very diverse new farmer demographic. Um, we work with a lot of young folks, uh, second career farmers, um, people choosing to retire to farming. Um, and we also work with the Association of Africans Living in Vermont to assist refugees resettling in Vermont to start ag businesses. So just to familiarize you with our project goals, uh, we are working to decrease the time between uh, someone having the idea of starting a farm and actually starting the farm business, and then also to increase the percent of family income earned from the farm business. And we're hoping to help people uh, get that to at least 51% of family income coming from the farm. Um, so in our work with new farms, uh, we've identified common needs um, that everyone needs to sustain a successful farm business. And uh, we see this as, you know, articulated goals and decision-making skills, commercial scale production skills as differentiated from, you know, homestead or hobby scale farm uh, skills. Of course, access to land, which is a big challenge for New farms, uh, new farmers, um, access to adequate capital, both for you know startup as well as operating uh, expenses, and then of course access to market. Um, and everyone comes to the table with a different skill set, um, different strengths and weaknesses. And what we found uh, what matters is identifying the areas that need work and then making plans to make progress. Uh, so our new farm business uh, technical assistance focuses on on these areas. So um, Ava asked me to try and diagram uh, the work that we do, and this is my attempt at that. Um, you know, when people approach us, the first thing we always do is work with them on articulating goals and and prioritizing, and and then they you know travel through this uh, trajectory of accessing resources and. Um, you know, receiving services and, you know, possibly some follow-up. And then, you know, we hope to see some aspect of farm business development, whether that's actually getting a farm started or making some kind of you know, improvement that helps people feel like their farms are on the road to success. And, um, you know, we do work with people up to uh, 10 years uh, as defined by the USDA new, um, new farmer. And so as time progresses, we, we do see people return to us um, for, you know, additional assistance as they're starting, you know, a new enterprise or they might be uh, expanding or trying to access a new market. And of course, along the way, um, some people decide not to pursue a farm business at this time for various reasons. Um, but we do see people you know, return to us, um, you know, we've experienced this, especially with people who are, you know, in an apprentice or farm worker situation when they first approach us and realize that, you know, they might be on a 10-year trajectory um, to getting their farm, start, uh, their farm started rather than, you know, starting one in, within the year. So, um, and then, of course, you know, this isn't an exactly uh, linear process. People jump around quite a bit as they learn. They obviously realize they need different resources or perhaps different services than when they set out. Um, so we help people uh, navigate all of that. So uh, to help farmers understand their strengths and weaknesses in those core need areas, we felt like we needed a tool um, to help guide our discussions as uh, technical service providers um, and also to help farmers understand the um, you know, the whole range of skills that they, they really need to start a successful farm business. And so we developed this web. And, you know, this web tool is, um, you see this around, and we modified it for our needs. Um, so within each uh, core area, we articulated additional needs that we felt would be in, indicative of competence, uh, competency. Um, and the assessment was designed to be directed by the farmer. We don't have a rubric we use to determine whether someone gets a 10 on savings or a three on savings in that access to capital category. Um, the farmer and service provider together, you know, come up with a rating based on, you know, really on what uh, the personal goals are and the, the business goals are. Um, you know, at you know, sometime, you know, a um, savings might be more important. Um, and as people, 
you know, develop a business, they might uh, realize they need, you know, a greater amount in savings as backup. And so that really can fluctuate based on business goals and needs. Um, so that's just one example. Um, so, you know, what drove this um, process in developing this tool? Uh, so I don't, you know, know what your experience is, but um, I feel like this is a, a pretty good visual representation of many of my um, first meetings with, with new farmers. Um, one of the most common things we hear from new farmers is how they feel overwhelmed by all the different aspects of their business idea. They feel lost in, you know, the maze of resources and services available, and they're having a hard time finding the information they need, you know, specific to their farm business and, and to their stage of development. And also, they don't know how to prioritize all of this work. It seems really, it all seems really important to them. Um, so this is where our web comes in. Uh, in a conversation, in person, or on the phone, uh, we do this during classes and workshops. We also meet one-on-one -on -one with uh, new farmers at uh, area conferences. We use this web to the, direct the conversation to the core need areas and ask questions on all of these points. Uh, it usually takes us about 20 to 30 minutes for the process. And um, as we go along, you know, you're, you're asking people good questions and having conversations and, you know, pretty soon you have a, a web that looks like this. Um, and then, you know, the power comes in uh, when we connect all these dots and hopefully we have a pretty good visual representation of the strengths and weaknesses. And the great thing here is that everybody has strengths um, and, uh, you know, whether they're coming from, you know, a farming background or not, um, uh, you know, we find these strengths, but then also it becomes pretty clear what the weaknesses are and, and again, how can we help prioritize. Um, we also use this when people call us with specific questions, and often that's our first contact with new farmers. People call and say, you know, can I get a grant for a high tunnel or I need a loan to buy a farm? And we do our best, the best we can to address those immediate issues, um, but then guide our conversations against these core areas to help new farmers think through all of their needs so they can start and grow their operations sustainably. Um, so I wanted to show you um, some real life uh, farm webs that I did at some uh, conferences recently, um, just to give you an example of, um, you know, a few folks we've worked with and what it looked like for them. So here's an example of one I recently completed with um, someone who has been a farm worker for I think about 10 years now. Um, he worked with us last year um, was, you know, interested in starting a farm then, but really needed to do some work on, you know, his values and um, decision-making skills uh, related to what kind of a farm he wanted to start. So he actually took some classes and um, got some technical assistance and uh, really came along in that area. Uh, he also, you know, he's spent a lot of time gaining field experience. He's got great mentors. Um, he was able to ha uh, get into some management roles on farms. Um, so he's really done a lot in his skill building. What he sees as his, you know, primary um, challenge right, ne right now is land tenure. And I think what's interesting in this one is just to see how, you know, his ability to access land is, um, you know, directly connected to what some of his weak areas are, which is he doesn't have a credit history um, he's still, you know, working. He knows how to do a business plan now, but he hasn't actually put together his business plan, um, and he needs to confirm markets. Um, so all of these things are, um, you know, related, and it was helped us to have a really great conversation about, okay, how can you work on your credit history? Um, where are you at with your business plan? And, you know, coming up with some action steps to make progress on those points. Um, you can see here on his access to land that, you know, he rates pretty high on infrastructure and access to markets and things because he is working with a farmer on a one-year lease. Um, he's going to rent an acre to get his business up and going um, while he looks for a permanent home for his farm. Uh, so here's another example of um, uh, someone who has retired and decided to start a farm and came to us looking for um, technical assistance. And again, I feel like this is pretty typical of what we see of people who um, come to us uh, from kind of this background, uh, generally having, you know, good assets, good uh, credit history. Most of the time they've already bought the farm and uh, come to us as their, you know, second step in um, figuring out how to get a farm business started. Um, 
and haven't had to focus on really a business plan, uh, although oftentimes they have business planning skills, but uh, because they haven't needed to access uh, capital, um, they, you know, haven't really needed a business plan. And then, you know, really um, lots of homesteading, possibly gardening skills, um, but not uh, not a lot of commercial production skills. So um, that, you know, leads to a conversation about how, you know, how do you access um, and learn about uh, growing commercially um, when you already have your own farm and, you know, uh, finding mentors, uh, getting connected with networks, uh, that kind of thing. So after we do this assessment, um, the self-assessment and, and identify some priority areas, um, we then move to our learning plan. Um, it's, you know, basically an action plan. Um, this is just two pages, but for each core area we have uh, you know, a little template to fill out. And we try and have people um, focus on no more than three areas um, to work on. Uh, so we come up with an objective, try not to make it something that they feel like they can, can complete in three to six months. Um, and uh, then the, you know, clear action steps that are going to help them make progress um, in that area. So, you know, actually um, production skills, if, you know, the objective would be to, you know, gain commercial production st skills, an action step might be, you know, join the Vermont uh, Veg and Berry Growers Association Network and we'll serve. Um, try and keep it really concrete, you know, uh, uh, attainable, all of those things. Um, and then we encourage people to get back to us. And if they complete, you know, their, their action plan um, in quicker than three months, that's awesome. We'll work with them again on, you know, what are the next steps they can take to, for their next set of challenges. So just to share with you kind of some of our outcomes so far, um, uh, this is based on an August 2013 survey we did of farmers who participated in our project and also reporting from our partner organizations. Um, we've uh, coached um, 234 farmers um, so far in the two years of the project. Um, 157 um, we have documented as creating learning plans. Uh, 71 have gone on to start a farm business and 46 um, reported improvement in farm business performance. And um, you know that performance can be financial performance, it can also be efficiency, you know, confidence. Um, but again, this is uh, self-generated reporting um, you know, of how farmers are feeling about about their farm business status. So we welcome you to use the web and associated learning plan to assert the goals and objectives of your organization. Um, you know, modify the core areas to reflect the areas that you're working with on farmers to address um, and the learning plan to reflect opportunities in your area. Um, we found it's, you know, a great tool um, and something we can return to with farmers to really um, get a sense of, you know, how they're filling out that, that skill, um, that pie of skills. Uh, so what we do ask is that you keep our logo and contact information on, on the plans and also the identifying um, information for the grant um, since it did support the development of this resource. Um, also, we're happy to work with you um, or to talk with you about um, our program and how we use it. Um, and please feel free to visit our website. We have a lot of resources there for new farmers. We also have a specific page um, for service providers um, that we welcome you to explore as well. So thank you very much. It's been great speaking with you guys today. Thank you so much, Jesse. That was fantastic. And what a really great resource. Um, so one of the questions that we had is, folks, I know it's a BFRDP funded project. Folks wanted to know if it's available on Start Farm. Uh, yes, it is. Um, we have been uh, uploading um, our things onto Start to Farm, so you should be able to find it there. Great. And we're also, um, NIFI is also going to be including the web assessment tool as part of our um, guide to metrics and evaluation, which I will discuss later on in the webinar. Um, and then there's another question that we had for you, which is um, when you're talking about improving the farm business, what does that actually measure? So, you know, we we look at this from, uh, you know, a whole farm perspective, um, you know, using social sustainability models. Um, it's not just uh, farm uh, financial performance, although that is an indicator that we use, um, but we're also looking at, you know, confidence, um, people feeling networked, um, uh, 
you know, time management and how people feel like, uh, you know, they've made improvements in those areas. So um, there's a lot of ways when farmers are reporting to us for them to indicate that they feel like um, they've made improvement on their farm. It's really relative is what you're saying, and it's related to the goals of the farmer themselves rather than some sort of outside arbiter of what exactly. is Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, we are tracking financial information. We are asking farmers. Um, that is one of the, you know, outcomes um, that we're hoping to see. Uh, so we do ask people for, you know, fairly specific financial information related to their, you know, changes in their farm business. Um, but it's not the only thing that we're looking for. Great. Um, again, thank you so much. And like Jesse said, great. Thanks so much, Jesse. That was really great. And what a fantastic resource. Um, now, Maggie Donan from the Intervale Center is going to talk about their farmer assessment tools. Go ahead, Maggie. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Maggie Donan. And uh, again, I'm the beginning farmer specialist here at the Intervale Center. Um, so my work here involves um, running and managing our farm incubator program and um, also doing business planning and coaching beginning farmers all over the state um, of Vermont. I'm not going to talk about um, our metrics and evaluation for our beginning farmer business planning outside of the interval. Um, I think Jesse did a really good job sort of talking about some of the tools that um, I use for that work. Um, so I'm going to focus on how we um, measure our success and growth of our farmers here um, that we're leasing land to. So just to begin with um, a brief overview again of our program. So um, we lease land to two different types of farms. Uh, the first is a mentor farm, which are uh, established businesses who at one time were incubators here before we had a time frame when incubators had to transition out of and off of our land. So they're established businesses uh, that have been in business, you know, here for more than five years now. Um, they have longer term leases with us. Some, some of them have 10 year leases and they provide mentorship to incubator farmers. So they're really the heart of our program in terms of um, being providing on the ground mentorship and just side by side support to the incubators. Um, and then our incubator farmers can lease land with us for up to five years and they go through an application process that includes a business plan in order to access land and they receive uh, subsidized lease rates um, for their first three years that they're here compared with the mentor farm. So that's just an important distinction to make before we get into some of the tools that we use. So we have four main evaluation tools um, that we have in place right now in our process. Uh, so the first is an end of year incubator self-evaluation. The next is a farm report, which all farmers uh, fill out, both our incubators and our mentor farmers. Exit interviews, which we do with incubators exiting after their five-year uh, term or, let, you know, if they're here less than five years, or, in, or mentor farmers who are exiting um, to transition onto a permanent farm somewhere else or who may be deciding to no longer continue farming. And then we also have a lot of qualitative evaluation, so stories of success and failure um, that we feel like are a really essential piece to evaluating our work. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is our end-of-year incubator self-evaluation. So this is a list of questions that we give to incubators for them to answer. Um, so, you know, this can be a process where either I sit down with them and we go through the question together and I sort of take notes and then write up some um, some the thoughts of the meeting after that. Or many times I'll just send them the questions to them and they can fill them out on their own and send them back to me. Um, so this really helps to inform the both short and long term business planning. Um, we don't compile the answers into any sort of report as we do our farm report, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, they're just kept with their files. And really, it's something for me to look at to help me in, help inform my work um, that they can do in the off season, the work that we can do together. So here is a copy of the self-evaluation that I just um, copied and pasted right into this slide. So you can see it's really about goals. Um, it's not so much about collecting data, like what was your farm income, um, that comes, I'll talk about that later, but this is really, did your farm meet its goals? So it's financial goals, production goals, operation goals, um, you know, satisfaction around your farm operation. Um, 
certified, being certified organic or not, um, and, you know, changes that you hope to make in the next year. So this is something that, you know, if a farm really says, you know, I didn't meet my financial goals, but I did meet my production goals and my operations goals, you know, it's an opportunity for me to be able to um, sit down with them and say, okay, you know, let's look over your financials and let's figure out how to get to those goals. So it's really important in order for incubators to be able to fill this out and feel comfortable. It's important that, you know, before you begin a season that you set some, some goals with them um, so that they can, they understand those goals and they can look back and have a sense of whether they met those or not. So the next piece um, that's really the bulk of our data collection and um, evaluation is our farm reports. So again, it's the most comprehensive data collection process that we have for incubation. Um, so we send out a questionnaire each fall um, to the, all of the farms, mentors, and incubators, and then they're due um, every year, February 14th, sort of an easy day to remember. Um, you know, again, it's important to remember that that's our goal for collection. Many times we don't end up getting them on that date. Um, that's very normal, I think, for us to be chasing farmers down. We wouldn't like to, but it's just the way that it is. Um, and we work pretty hard to get all of the reports that we can. It's important for us. Um, when I collect them, I compile them into an annual report, which is what I'm doing right now. So, you know, usually around March, April time um, is when we've actually received all the reports and we can put them together um, into, you know, usually a four or five page document that sort of summarizes how our season went and how the season went for the farms. Um, and then in addition, we collect gross sales data and, and um, expenses and net income um, that we use for a, a spreadsheet um, to track, you know, the total um, value of food grown here and also to track business growth. So we can look at, you know, how is farmers' gross income growing over time? How is their net income growing over time? Um, and we ask people to specify, you know, whether the net income that we collect is before or after their owners draw. So we really want to be able to interpret this information as clearly as we can. So again, I just took the farm report and I copied it right on here. Um, you can see we collect information about markets. We collect information about donated time and donated food, um, gross and net income again, employment, um, household income. So this is a question here you can see on the right, um, this number of people in the household and what percentage of median income um, they fall into. And this is one of those questions that, you know, it's really sort of a pain, I think, for farmers to fill this out. They don't necessarily always know um, what their spouses, you know, their their employees' spouses, and so where their employee maybe falls into this chart. But this is something that, you know, grant for grant reporting, we have to collect this because it's a federal, I can't remember if it's for a federal or a state grant, but they want to know this. Um, and we indicate that in the questionnaire, and I think that helps farmers to say, okay, you know, this isn't some very annoying piece of information that the Interval Center wants to collect, but they have to do this for funding. Um, so we're also, this year, for the first time, we had to collect information about race and ethnicity. Again, this is for a, um, this is for a, um, a grant report, um, which, and I think that next year, we're not going to be receiving funding through any of these that ask about the median income or the race and ethnicity. So we're not going to have to collect this information. So we can take out some of these questions that seem like they're sort of annoying to answer. Um, we ask about land use protocol compliance, so farm, you know, certified organic, um, you know, what they're doing if they're not compatible with VOF, um, the Vermont Organic Farmers Certification Rules. Um, you know, this is sort of a weird question in that we're asking them to say, you know, are you disobeying our land use policies? And really, you know, we just want to understand if, if they're doing something that's not in compliance. Most of the time, it's something like they're using Biotella, um, and, you know, we're not going to police that. Um, we just don't have the time or the, you know, the capacity to do that. Obviously, if someone put down something like, you know, they're spraying a some fertilizer that's, you know, harmful or something like that, we would say, you know, we'd immediately talk to them and take some measures to change that. Um, we ask about cover cropping, you know, changes in livestock, um, vandalism or theft, which is a problem for us. And it's good for us to understand what's happening with that. Um, we ask about pests and disease, um, which is really important for us to understand how that's changing. 
um, infrastructure improvements, um, and then for mentor farms, how they're spending their they're spending their mentor time. You can see at the bottom, we also try to collect any soil tests taken this year. That's something that we haven't done a very good job with um, being consistent about collecting those. And I would really like to try to be more consistent and maybe to try to, you know, hire a student or something who could look back at some historical soil tests and, and really be able to write a report maybe on what is our long-term impact on the soil and the, um, you know, the soil diversity bin and the species diversity bin on here um, since we've started incubation, you know, for the last 20 years, how has that changed? Um, in addition to looking back at more specific historical data about pest disease or weed problems and how that has changed, um, again, it's something that, you know, we just don't have the time or anybody's job to do that right now, but I'd like to find some time. So the other, another uh, tool we use are exit interviews. So again, when farms transition out after incubation, after many or after they close their business, we try our best to conduct an interview with them. Um, it's a tool for, you know, us to improve our program and also um, for us to, you know, learn about what's working well and what's not. Um, it can be difficult to track people down once they leave. Um, you know, we have a number of farms that are exiting this year, and um, I'll probably be able to do exit interviews with two out of the the four that are leaving. Um, so, you know, we just try to try to get them from whoever we can. Um, and this is super important. You know, it's really the farm's time to speak up and say, you know, this was really difficult for me. This was really um, valuable. So here's the sort of the outline for the exit interview. We don't have a very specific form, but it's here's the things that we should talk about. So you know, um, how accurate their business plan was, failures and lessons learned, how was their interaction and their support from staff, the, what do they think about the application process, um, you know, and then can potential applicants contact you, contact you about future, future collaborations or support. So um, these are really important. So just to talk a little bit about metrics, so this is sort of a very brief list of, of the bulk of the metrics that we collect. I think there's a lot of things that aren't on here, but, um, you know, there's a lot of things that are very numbers-based, like um, number of shares that are coming off of this land, quantity of donated product or time, gross sales and net income, you know, how many jobs are created every year, what household income levels, um, that kind of stuff, how many acres are cover cropped and, you know, and over a winter. Um, and so this this kind of stuff, you know, a lot of it is driven by what grant reporters want to see, but a lot of it is also driven by what is useful for us in telling our story and then what is useful for us in improving our program. So there's a lot of great numbers that can get pulled out, like, you know, how many pounds of food are coming out of the Interval, um, you know, how many uh, uh, people owners or employees are, are being, um, you know, having their jobs sustained because we run these programs, all these kinds of things. Um, and then, you know, again, the things like, um, you know, uh, income level and race and ethnicity and some of that stuff is, is more motivated by grant reporting. And we might still want to collect that information, but we may ask it in a very, those questions in a very different way that's easier for farmers to, to sort of understand. So then specifically the metrics for incubators, um, you know, I think it's all of the things that I mentioned here, but it's also you know, goal, really, really based around goals. Like I was saying in the beginning, when we talk about the exit, the incubator, um, annual incubator self-evaluation, you know, it's really important with them to establish these financial personal production goals um, before each season, you know, when they're sort of doing end of season um, thinking and then thinking ahead towards the next season and redoing their business plan and um, adding or taking things away or changing it, um, that these these specific goals are created. Um, so that farmers can can think about, you know, their success and failure based around did they meet their goals or not. Um, because many times those, you know, the purely financial things are not going to be able to, you know, how much money they made or how many people they employed, that's going to take maybe a long time, you know, a few years for those to seem like success, successful, in, you know, changes. But the goals are what's going to get them there. Um, you know, we also measure things like how is their ability to make decisions on their farm? How is their confidence? How is their knowledge um, base? And have they made changes to the farm or has a change been made to the farm? And so that's ways for us to measure sort of the incubator specifically. So then additional data we collect, um, 
the number of people interested in the incubator program. So I keep, you know, just a spreadsheet of how many people have we had apply this year or, or show any kind of interest. And that helps us understand, you know, are we is outreach successful? Do, should we, you know, do we have an overwhelming number of applicants? Do we not have very many applicants? Um, the number of people who actually apply, the number of new farms each year, the ratio of mentor farms to incubator farms, you know, like where do we want that number to be and how close are we to that? And then again, these business planning metrics um, that Jesse spoke a little bit about and that I talked about back in this previous slide around, um, you know, confidence and decision-making skills. Um, so finally, um, this sort of ties into on the, the second slide, I talked about what we measure and I, I talked about that qualitative um, stories of success and failure. So, you know, the last thing that we collect is, is anecdotes from people about their experience. So, um, you know, I'll have them, you know, uh, write a couple of sentences about how this year has gone or how this, what this experience has given them and offered them. And these are super important to collect, um, not only for develop purposes and for purposes of sharing your story and, um, you know, promoting your project, but also just to be able to, um, you know, see, you have some of those descriptors of like, what is this program? What is the effect that this is having? Um, stories hold really powerful information and insight. Um, and I also think it's a way to take a failure and show, you know, what are some of the successes that came out of a failure? So a farm might say, you know, in their quantitative data, it might show that, you know, they lost X amount of money and, you know, they're no longer farming and they didn't employ anybody but themselves. And, you know, they're at the lowest income um, rate level, um, but uh, a failure through the lens um, of, you know, data may not really actually be a failure when you look at a qualitative statement by that person. So they might say, you know, this experience helped me understand my personal goals, um, you know, the goals that I want for my life and made me realize that, you know, I'm actually really interested in education and not in production and I'd rather pursue an education, a career in education, or I'm really interested in you know, distribution of food and not necessarily growing it. So um, I think the qualitative data collection is really important. Um, so that's all I have for now. Um, I think I'm at a little bit over 15 minutes, so I'll stop. Um, but I'm happy to, you know, take any questions from anybody um, or you can send me an email or give me a call. My contact information is here. If you have any questions about um, metrics, the, you know, the way we measure our program and evaluate. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Maggie. I really appreciate all of your insight. And I just want to remind people that the tools that Maggie talked about from the interview and the surveys are going to be available um, as part of the metrics and evaluation toolkit that, um, that we're releasing soon. So you can go check our, our resources page or um, resource library page on the NICU website. And um, all of that good stuff will be there. Thanks so much, Maggie. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn everything over to Chris Brown from the Agriculture and Land-Based Training Association, and they're based in the Salinas Valley in California. Chris, go right ahead. Thank you, Ava. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about our monitoring and evaluation. We're going to focus on the challenges we're having. We're sort of in a transition period. Um, I'm the new executive director. I've been around a couple of years now. We've had quite a few personnel changes from the people who are uh, handling uh, our ME prior to people are since um, we've had another opportunity. So we're kind of grappling with the old system and, and trying to orient it uh, in a different way, which is um, what I'm going to focus on. Um, so a little bit, just a little bit about um, the organization. We, we were founded back in 2001, and it's a farmer development program, but also a food hub. So we are, um, you know, leasing land to farmers, also uh, actively marketing the vast majority of the produce, the organic produce that they, that they grow. Um, and we serve about 75 um, farmers in a given year. Um, about 45 of those are actually um, renting our land and plan to start their business. And they're mostly low-income uh, Latino participants. Um, and uh, we're on 150 acres at two sites in Monterey County, about 30 miles apart. Um, since our founding, um, about 300 have entered our education course, which is the first year um, of our uh, program. About uh, 200 of those, maybe a little bit under, have actually graduated that nine-month course. And after that, uh, the second year, um, the incubator starts. We're actually leasing land and trying to launch their business. About 90 have entered the incubator 
um, 45, fully half of those is still on our land. Um, we have not had the pressure to move them off so urgently because uh, it took a while to populate all those 150 acres. And, um, but just now, um, the newer participants are kind of pushing the older ones off. So we're going to have more and more graduates hopefully operating off our land. Um, just 20 or so have moved off and are still farming at this point. And we hope to double or triple that in the coming years. So in terms of our um, monitoring evaluation goals, um, obviously, you know, the very most basic is intake. We want to register the demographic information, the baseline farmer information, um, which we're going to, um, you know, uh, track in the years that they're involved in the program, hopefully track progress, but also uh, tracking the program activities, um, the, the level of participation, the level of compliance of our farmers, which we, we grade them on um, as they go forward. Um, and, um, most importantly, perhaps, we want to evaluate individual farmer performance, um, how they're doing in terms of productivity, in terms of profitability, uh, revenue, and so on, all the key um, economic data that, uh, that evaluates uh, basically how well they're doing with their livelihoods and hopefully showing um, you know, improvements in their livelihoods over the years. And then there's kind of more macro data, measuring the overall economic impact of the ALBA programs. You know employment, um, overall investment, uh, overall revenues generated and going to the pockets of uh, our, our small um, startup farmers. So those are the, uh, that's the general overview. Looking at the data we actually collect on a, on a routine basis. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the, the demographic data we do uh, on intake. Um, we use our Salesforce uh, database for this. Um, and uh, this is, of course, used for um, very comes in handy for reporting and, and proposal development, too, because people want to know what starting incomes are, kind of what the profile of our farmers are, um, our, our target market, so to speak. Um, we also have to track the output data, like any programs do that uh, receive grants. How many trainings are we giving? Who are the attendees? What are the topics? Uh, and so on, um, publications produced, um, and so on. It's a pretty straightforward stuff we're using Salesforce for. And this is what was set up um, just prior to my arrival. Um, it largely focuses on, on output data, very straightforward basic data. Um, I've created, since I've um, arrived, a number of different uh, spreadsheets that help us um, track uh, programmatic issues. Um, this is more for management of the program than for evaluation and statistics. Um, for instance, I have a spreadsheet. Um, I just call it Alba Incubator. It has got a number of different sheets, but it, it has all the pharma data um, in terms of their tenure, the acreage they're on, the amount of cover crop they're, do, um, they're doing in a given year, the amount of strawberries, which is a, a, a restricted crop, um, uh, their crop plans, um, and other statistics like that, just to make sure that they're staying on point and, and hitting their marks that we've agreed upon. Um, and there's other compliance issues too. Uh, Kaylee uh, Grimlin just started as the enterprise development specialist, and she's um, helping them with business development issues, um, financial planning, crop planning, um, but also on their compliance side, uh, organic and food safety certification, uh, making sure that any trainings that uh, they have to go to, that they are um, attending. Um, they have an ongoing education requirement of so many hours, depending on the year, for instance. And so she tracks that, making sure that they're getting their general liability insurance, making sure that they're hitting all the marks before we uh, sign a lease with them um, on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, and that's just tracked in an Excel sheet um, to make it easier. Um, since we run a food hub, we're basically running um, a business under the umbrella of the nonprofit. So we're, we've got QuickBooks for that. Um, and so that, that, that spits out all sorts of data um, that we're reporting um, to the board on for sales and expenses and, and whatnot. And so this feeds right into our um, kind of overall macro data and probably the most telling um, statistic that, that, that we quote in terms of overall economic impact is the growth in Alba Organics and the amount that we are um, selling out into the market um, on behalf of our participating farmers. And this, this number has grown by 10 times in the last five years. Uh, it was 500,000 um, back in uh, 2008. And uh, we just surpassed 5 million um, in 2013. 
um, growth is slowing considerably, of, of course. We can't keep up that pace of growth. But um, we expect to double uh, again in the next uh, several years. So um, that's a very telling statistic. Um, and then we can break it down by farmer, by product, um, and per acre uh, 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 revenues that our farmers are generating. So those are interesting statistics, too, that, um, that are generated just by virtue of, of, of running the business. Now, um, outcomes. Uh, this is probably the most important um, you know, statistic uh, for any monitoring and evaluation initiative, um, but it's also the most difficult because it involves that individual farmer data um, that uh, relies not only on the farmer's openness, which varies, um, but also on their record keeping and our ability to, to, to um, track that and uh, assist in that process. And because we're dealing with uh, people with different levels of education um, and, uh, you know, business experience, this is particularly um, challenging. And this is Kaylee's task to really get much better at um, recreating or creating, um, you know, financial projections. And then at the end of the year, um, really nailing down um, statistics like um, productivity, um, overall revenues, and while well, the revenues are easy, the, the expenses. Uh, that are more difficult and um, tracking the balance sheet and employment and so on. Um, so this is something that's a real challenge and something that that, uh, that we have yet to master, so to speak. And for what I understand of other programs, and in my experience and um, doing uh, development on an international level, th this is always a challenge. Um, and so we're very interested in interfacing with other programs and uh, food hubs and, and seeing how they do it. Uh, another area, uh, that last poll, um, uh, uh, that we're very interested in, in, in um, spending more time on is um, careers. Um, in other words, how did uh, the ALBA um, credential uh, influence their career trajectory? Um, I think I've heard from numerous other programs that, you know, most aspiring farmers um, don't end up to be um, ongoing farmers. Um, there's a fairly high, you can call it a failure rate, but it's more, you know, just a, a fact of life that um, farming is very hard, very risky, uh, and, you know, I've, not everybody turns out to be a successful farmer. Do your, uh, continues to endure the very hard work and risky nature of the business. But um, that doesn't, that's not to say that um, it's a failure at all. If they can use this credential, go, go take it and work for someone else uh, and, and do better for themselves. That's also a success. So, what we have to do a better job of is taking those, uh, contacting and interfacing with our graduates of our farmer education course and those who didn't make it all the way through the incubator and um, keeping them on the alumni list and giving them regular calls and trying to track their career trajectory and see how, how their involvement in our program has hopefully improved um, their careers. So it's really this last point, the, the, the outcomes that we are, I, I'd say, relatively weak on and really trying to, to bolster. Um, this quickly, I'll just go through, but we kind of have already. We use Salesforce for mostly the demographic information and outputs. And we're now set up to collect about 50 data points. Most of those are just very um, output, factually oriented, and don't deal with um, outcomes. Um, we use QuickBooks for our food hub data. Our, uh, we use Excel for our programmatic data. We're currently we're using Excel for um, for our outcome data as well, but uh, that may change if we look uh, further into it. Um, the number four point there is just talking about other monitoring evaluation, planned and unplanned interactions, just to keep tabs on the farmers and um, to, to see how they're doing. Even if, even if it's not documented, it's important to do the daily technical assistance in the field meeting farmers at least monthly and then having an open door policy for grievances and conversations and um, be it in my office or, or getting out in the field and talking to them just so we're keeping tabs. Also very important. Uh, so let's move on to shortcomings. Um, like I said, we don't have a centralized database. We kind of have different tools for each type of data. Salesforce was originally intended to be that centralized database, um, but it's a pretty rigid uh, and pretty expensive um, database to change. And since it was set up largely for output and demographic data, um, 
not so easy to handle this, uh, this outcome data. So we're kind of winging it um, in Excel for the time being. And uh, we may find a system later on that supports Salesforce altogether. Or we may continue to run them in parallel. We'll, we'll, we'll have to see. Um, yeah, for the incubator farmer outcome, this is not fully developed, um, but we're diving into this uh, with Kaylee's, um, Kaylee coming on board. Um, we're still piloting methods um, to collect outcome data, but mostly it is um, just interfacing with the farmer, making sure they have the projections for the year and hopefully, you know, meeting them several times during the year to see if they're staying on track and then having a more intensive meeting at the end of the year to review their uh, financial performance. Um, and again, the, the, the shortcoming there or the obstacle there, of course, is um, the response is the data is actually um, dependent on relatively erratic farmer record keeping and, and occasionally a reluctance to share this information. Um, so we're going to have to overcome that as well. And the message to farmers generally is uh, this is confidential. Um, we'll never, you know, share it, associate any farmer's um, name with uh, individual farmer data. We'll try to uh, present cumulative data. Um, so there's no risk of repercussions there. And of course, the, the stronger hopefully the argument is that they'll be convinced that these types of numbers are very, very important for the development of their business. It's important that they have a handle on them so that they can plan their expansion um, and the financial health of their, of their uh, nascent business. Uh, and then alumni outcomes, we talked about a little bit. Um, the database of participants is um, incomplete, but it's something I worked quite a bit on last um, summer. Um, we had several different sources uh, that I tried to synthesize. Um, so it's much more complete now, but we're still working on it. And this year is the year for um, outreach uh, and connecting with them, updating contact information, and um, doing kind of the first wave of evaluation of um, how the program has affected their careers. So um, that's a big project for us in 2014. And ultimately the vision is um, we're reporting not only on the existing farmers, but going all the way back and recreating this database and um, reporting on all Alba farmers since founding. Um, in which, you know, even though it was 13 years ago, the nice thing about that is, um, as I mentioned on the first slide, you know, there's only been about 200 graduates total. It's not an overwhelming number uh, of, of people. I, I'd imagine that the, the, given that we're dealing with a lot of immigrants who are going back and forth to Mexico, um, we'll only be able to get a percentage of those uh, in contact uh, with on an ongoing basis. So it's not an overwhelming number. I think it's a very doable thing. But ultimately, um, what we want to do um, with this outcomes emphasis is to quantify the impact of the program. Um, and I think the top line number, ultimately, the number of successful farm enterprises started and graduated and continuing to operate off Alba land. That's kind of our holy grail. Um, that's something I'm really kind of laser focused on over the next few years to, to increase. Um, as I mentioned, the numbers are around 20 now. I'd like to get up to 50 in a hurry. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, we've got a, a relatively strong pipeline um, it, right now. Those 45 that are on our land, several have been on our land for you know, more than three years, seem committed to farming, and uh, and we'll graduate with them off up and transition um, in the next couple of years. Um, that total revenue and the profit generated, obviously, those are very important numbers. Jobs created um, and retained, um, also very important from a donor perspective. Um, from a program effectiveness pr perspective. And, and looking at the individual um, average income growth, well, ultimately what we're trying to do um, is improve the livelihood, improve the economic opportunity of our participants. So um, really focusing in on the individuals and, and getting um, hard numbers about where, on average, where they start and where they end up, say, after several years of involvement in the program. Another interesting number is uh, I'd like to track is the total acreage farmed um, by ALBA alumni, because what this says is, you know, not only is it taking into account the number of farm enterprises started by our program, but also on the extent to which they're growing out there. Uh, and so if we can get, you know, eventually several hundred acres uh, or even a thousand um, farmed organically and launched uh, under uh, under ALBA's uh, 
program, um, I think it's a very challenging uh, impact we're creating. Um, as far as the, the data itself, um, you know, expressing impact and outcomes is very important. Um, but it's also important in communicating to potential program participants of what they can expect um, over the first few years of involvement in the program and, and, and launching their business. Um, you know, what, what income can they expect? Um, what is the level of investment that is required um, to be able to start up? Uh, a farm enterprise over the first few years. Um, I think uh, once we have more graduates off our land too, we can examine you know different farm business models, different um, marketing strategies, um, the different sizes of farms. Um, do they continue to depend on our food hub, or do they will they be more profitable if they get in the farmers markets or CSAs? They're doing a uh, direct retail marketing. Um, these are things that yeah we have information on now. But because there have been relatively few graduated off, there's not enough robust data for us to make um, a whole lot of definitive conclusions. But as we do better monitoring and evaluation and work with our farmers and transitioning them off and studying their business models, we'll um, better be able to use them as models um, to inform uh, future participants. Uh, yeah, and, and then, uh, you know, once we better collect all this information, um, setting organizational performance targets will will also be um, easier in terms of uh, you know projecting increases in revenue on average, and in terms of projecting number of graduates we can produce in a given year, and so on. Um, but we need the hard data to be able to to do that. So uh, this is this is kind of what our vision is um, for where we want to go. In summary. It's going to be far less output oriented. In other words, you know, how many people sat in this training, how many trainings, how many quarterly newsletters are producing and much more outcome um, oriented, um, which gets into the actual economic impact that we can create as, uh, as a result of our program. And this uh, gets into increases in income levels, increases in revenues, increases in acreage farms and so on. Um, that's the real um, economic impact data that we're trying to um, promote here um, through our program activities. And with that, um, I'd be happy to. Oh, next steps. <laughs> Again, let me just go through this quickly. I thought we'll reconstructing the Alba database. Um, we talked about it a little bit. I'm sure we include all participants. Um, uh, surveying past Albert participants and graduates to test their career trajectories and gauge the long-term impact of the program and improve our and refine our data collection methods. And I think I've done all these things. So I think I'm at my time limit. So I'm going to cut it off there. But you have access to the presentation. If there's any questions anybody has, please feel free to contact me or Kaylee directly. Um, this is not me. This is Rigo, one of our top farmers. Um, and we'd be happy to, uh, to answer any of your questions, but to beware, we're likely to have some of our own. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back over to Ava. Thanks so much, Chris. We really appreciate um, all your insight and your many, many years of experience in dealing with this issue, and I think that it really highlights how challenging it is for folks. So if you're having a hard time, you're not the only one. <laughs> um, and yeah, thanks again, Chris, for your time. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Now I'm going to share with all of you a little bit about the um, NIFTY Metrics and Evaluation Toolkit. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, our big focus has been um, in the past few years for NIFTY is metrics and evaluation, and we're going to continue to focus on that topic in the coming years. And to this end, we really wanted to create a resource that all projects could use, which would strengthen our collective capacity to show the impact of what we do. And we see this as sort of long-term capacity building for incubator projects. Um, and since we've had such great success with our NIFTY toolkit, we've started adding new resources like it to our library. So you may have seen the NIFTY case studies which came out last year. And now we have the metrics and evaluation toolkit. Um, so this is going to come out at the end of this week. I promise I'll send out a big announcement to the listserv with a link when we get up on the website. And we did keep hearing from programs that they were having a hard time accessing resources. 
um, and also explaining to their communities and supporters what their programs accomplished. And like, you know, like Chris and everyone has been saying, it's, it's definitely a challenge to gather data from individuals and from, from farmers in particular. So, um, you know, we all know how effective and important the work we do is, but we need to be able to get that message out into the world. And not just on an individual project level, right, but also as sort of a national movement um, that has a national impact. So there are a lot of resources out there for metrics and evaluation, Oops, sorry, um, and particularly in the nonprofit sector, but a lot of this information is too broad for people who are already busy running their programs to adapt for their work. And the hope of this guide was to gather the gold. So the best tools out there, the most applicable to our niche, the examples that are really relevant and compile it all into a short and easy to use manual. And we gathered content from a lot of sources, but especially we gathered it from a half-day workshop at the annual NIFI Field School this past September. We had about 30 participants from as many organizations come together and brainstorm and map how they track their outcomes and discuss strategies for cracking this really tough nut. Um, the main goals of this guide are to help you formulate achievable goals, develop tools, and tell a powerful story about what you do. So I'm just going to take you on a quick tour so you know what it'll have to offer. Um, so the first section really focuses on getting clear about why you need these metrics for your organization. Every project has slightly different goals based on their sponsor organization or the, co the communities and populations they're working with or a dozen other factors that make your project unique. So you have to know what you hope to achieve with your project, which means knowing what kind of story you want to tell. And then you can get clear on the metrics you'll need to back that story up. And the guide talks about both internal and external goals. So in terms of internal goals, like Chris was saying, um, using your resources wisely, making sure that the programs you're running are actually doing what you want them to do. And if they're not, um, better that you know now so you can make changes or figure out if it's time to take on new projects or drop things that aren't working. Um, and this is an opportunity to think about how to engage in robust internal evaluation processes as well, also strengthening your relationships and buy-in with your participants and with your staff. So external goals are obviously more about um, reporting your outcomes to funders and also to the community and gathering public support for what you do. And you may at some point need to convince, for example, a municipal official that it's important for you to keep receiving subsidized water access. And to do that, you're going to need to be able to explain the benefits of your work in tangible and quantifiable terms. And we also talk about how different types of metrics are designed for different audiences. So some will benefit your organization and for, are for internal use, and some will benefit the farmers you work for, and some are for the larger community of funders to understand what you do. But it's important to know which ones are which and keep those separate. Um, and we're also going to talk about um, the mechanics of gathering data, the how of getting the information you need. So there are some basic rules about what you can and can't attribute to your program. Um, there are software tools. You also want to know how you're going to operationalize evaluation in your organization. So who's gathering the data and when and how? And where does it go when you're done with it? Do you have tools for tracking and reporting? Do different kinds of data need to be treated differently for ethical reasons? And speaking of ethics, how will you make sure that the time you spend asking the farmer questions will actually be a valuable process for both of you? Um, so we'll get into all those how questions in this part of the guide. And then ultimately, um, this will be about tools for you to use. So to help synthesize some of the information presented, I'm going to include a couple of worksheets that can help you think through your own specific situations. And then the bulk of the guide is really in the appendices, which is where the tools live. So we've included a list of all the most common metrics being used by incubator projects across the country, along with the most common ways of measuring these indicators. Um, and you can pick and choose from these, obviously, based on how appropriate they are for your program, or just use them as a guide for developing your own metrics. Um, what's nice about these is they're very specific for land-based farming today, so you should find some useful ideas in there. Um, most of the metrics in the previous slide will be measured using some kind of annual or quarterly survey tool. So we've also included a number of these for your reference, which you can take and adapt to your own program. And finally, we also provide some sample classroom level evaluation, so you can think about pre- and post-measurements of farmer skills. New Entry has developed these over multiple years for use in our farm business planning class, and they're a really great tool for us, and we hope they'll be useful for you as well, um, especially in terms of thinking about how you lay out your learning goals in advance and gather ongoing feedback from participants about your own performance in the classroom. So, like I said, we're just putting the finishing touches on this, and it'll be available for download by the end of the week. And I do hope it's useful for all of you as you embark or continue working on your evaluation plan. Um, and if you 
have internal tools in your organizations that you feel like are really great and that work really well for you. Um, the Farmer Resource Library um, that we have on our website is a really great opportunity for people to upload those resources. We might also consider including them in future editions of the toolkit if that's something we want to share um, with people across the country because um, that's something I think we all benefit from is when we see as many examples as possible of people who are really doing a lot of the same kind of work that we are and how they address some of these challenges. So, oh, that's like that messed up. Um, I want to thank all of our presenters so much for sharing your knowledge and experience on this topic. And I just want to remind everybody also that the slides and recording of the webinar will be available on our website within the next couple of days. And you will get a link to that in our follow-up email. Um, I hope you're all getting your questions ready right now. And while you do that and input them into the chat box, I'm just going to give you a very quick heads up about the next events on the horizon for NIFI and how you can take advantage of our resources. Um, as I've been saying, we do have quite a bit of free one-on-one -on -one technical assistance and mentoring available to offer startup projects through our project partners, who include the Intervale and ALBA. So if you're interested in that, please do get in touch with me directly, and I can get you set up. Um, our third annual Firm Incubator School, again, will be taking place this fall at the Headwaters Incubator Program, which is a relatively new project, like I said, just outside of Portland, Oregon. Um, we'll be getting out of save the date for that next week. We're very excited to bring this to the West Coast. It's the first time we were in the Midwest last year and on the East Coast the year before that. So we're trying to get across the nation. Um, and past field schools have really been great professional development opportunities to network and learn from each other. We're going to have a mix of here presentations and attendee web working sessions on a wide variety of topics. Our webinar series will continue at the end of April with a focus on fundraising for incubator projects, and we'll have a more collaborative discussion-based format. Um, we're, we're experimenting with that. And in the fall, we'll start up again with webinars related mostly to transitioning farmers successfully off the incubator. So that's going to include really digging into financial literacy, land access, and more discussions about how we measure our outcomes. And again, our online resources, searchable database documents related to project management, a listserv, our toolkit and case studies. And finally, please do fill up the evaluation that I'm going to send everybody um, in a couple of days about this webinar. And always email or call if you have specific questions and feedback for us and how we're doing. We want to make sure that you're um, getting everything you need out of this program. So we're going to turn it over for questions and um, feedback for our NIFTY presenters. Um, and I'm going to start with a question for Maggie. Um, someone asked if you ask about employee wages and benefits on your survey. I think you should be able to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So we don't ask about um, about benefits. Um, but that is a really interesting question. Um, we are asking about um, income, like so uh, for the owners of the farm, we're asking about um, income level. You can see, um, I guess, I don't know, um, you, on if you, once people get the recording of the, or the PDF of the presentation, um, in our farms report, we ask about, um, we have the chart um, to determine household income levels. And so we do ask about um, farm of all the owners and the farm workers on your farm, how many fall into different categories. So we're not asking specifically about what people are paying their farmers, but we are asking um, of all the people on the farm, you know, how many fall into um, low income, extremely low income, moderate income. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a difficult question, I think, because the way that chart is set up is it's based on number of people in the household. So the owners, it's easier for them. I think it's pretty easy for them to determine where they fall in. But for a farm, you know, for a staff member who they have to then ask them also about their partner um, and, you know, what their, oh, sorry for that ringing. That sounds weird. Um, they also have to ask, you know, for their partner, how much is their partner making and then therefore, where does that, you know, what income level do they fall into as a household? Ava? Great. Yep. Okay. Yes. Thanks. 
Um, and another question for you, um, what is the time and effort? It's a little bit off topic, but I wonder if you could bring it back around to um, metrics and evaluation in terms of the time and effort you require of your mentor farmers. Like what is the time, like the sort of time commitment that you ask farmers for in general around your evaluation, um, particularly the mentor farmers who aren't necessarily like engaging in the program as like uh, beneficiaries in that way? Yeah, well, so the the mentor farmers here are all, so the mentorship um, is all between the mentor farmers that are actually here and the incubator farmers that are here. So we ask the mentor farmers to report on how they're spending their, it's supposed to be 20 hours a year that they spend on um, mentoring an incubator farmer. We also, they can also mentor another beginning farmer in the community. They can hold a workshop they can work with the UVM farmer training gram and offer mentorship that way. So the mentorship can happen in a number of different ways because of how few incubators we have. Um, and the evaluation, like when we ask them to fill out the farms report, that doesn't count as a mentor hour. So, you know, <laughs> the reporting that they're providing to us, like the, it, you know, it probably takes them a few hours to fill out the farm report each year. That's not considered mentorship hours. That's considered a responsibility of being here at the Intervale. Um, so, you know, we spend a lot of time talking with farmers and also talking with applicants about why farming here is different from farming, you know, on your own out at, you know, in off of a dirt road where you're sort of more isolated. So, you know, there are certain commitments that we're asking farmers to take part in. And, you know, generally, we're really lucky. We have an amazing community of farmers who are really willing to be involved. Um, you know, farming down here takes a lot of, you, you have to be interested in that communal, that, um, see sort of the greater good in working together as a group and the fact that sometimes that can take more time. Um, so, you know, that's that's sort of, that's the only evaluation that we're asking them to participate in. Um I get, does that answer the question? I think so. Chris, how um, how does that work for you all in terms of the time commitment and how do you set up, like, or attempt to set up at least a culture of people wanting to engage with the program around some of the administrative stuff? Well, I think you hit on it. Um, the culture um, is key, um, and that's what we're trying to build uh, or change here a little bit um, so that we're more a learning community here where information um, flows freely, where people are used to going to one another um, for um, experience sharing. Um, and so we don't, we've talked about having a mentor uh, uh, program in place. It's not formal now. I think there are some people who just have a more of a natural tendency to, to share, but I think they're the minority and there's um, still, still kind of a culture of um, competitiveness, even though it doesn't have much basis. Um, or justification. Uh, people kind of hold their, their cards close to their chests. Uh, and we're trying to change that. Um, realize that, you know, helping somebody else only helps the overall organization and, and our ability to market the product. So it's definitely win-win, um, but that's not always perception. Uh, so um, we're moving towards the mentorship, uh, more mentorship activities and could potentially throw in incentives for people to be able to stay longer should they act in this capacity. Um, I'm starting to identify um, candidates for it, but uh, as of now, we have no uh, formal program. Okay, um, so are there other incentives for people who engage, like participate in the surveys, like the annual surveys and things, or is that just considered part of the program responsibility when they sign yeah, up? Absolutely, it's part of their responsibility. Okay. I would also say from our perspective, you know, we definitely have a varying level of participation from our farm, from our mentor farms, especially when it comes to the evaluation process. Um, like another thing that we offer is end of the year, you know, annual <clears throat> sort of off season check-ins with our staff. And so we really view it as like sort of what the farms are willing to give is sort of what we're willing to give back in return. So, you know, we have farms who, are very engaged with us and they always fill out their farm report on time and then they sign up for a winter, you know, meeting with me and, you know, maybe <clears throat> our community relations manager and our ED and the five of us sit down and we, you know, we talk about potential ways for the Interval Center and the farmer to collaborate more, you know, for maybe for events. Maybe the farm is really interested in having more events and how can we collaborate. And so, you know, if they're 
if they're self-motivated and they're they're comfortable coming and taking advantage of the opportunities that we set up to learn, gather information from them, and then there tends to be, you know, my hope is that we have a lot to offer to them in return as well. And that strengthening that relationship and that like trust amongst, you know, the organization and the farmers through, you know, them making that information available to us will also help them in the end because, you know, we'll think of them when we have a tour or, you know, we'll think of them when we want to feature um, ARM as part of our um, community or something like that. You know, not that we're playing favorites, that's all I'm saying, but, you know, that the if a farmer is receptive to the work that we're trying to do, you know, that we see them as, you know, much easier to work with. Um, so I'm going to move on for a sec. So the, um, one of the questions was about the evaluation report templates. So from Maggie and Jesse, um, and I assume, Chris, you also have some reports um, that you create from your data. And I think that's a really important thing is sort of what do we do with this and what do we make it look like when we're, when we're done and we have all this information. Um, and I wonder if that's something that you all have shared in other areas or if you would be willing to share it with NIFI and we can put it into the toolkit or upload it to the website. Um, yeah, so I can't, our farm report, you know, we, we compile it um, every year. Oh. And I can't remember, I'm embarrassed to say, I can't remember right now if at this point those are considered confidential. Um, and something that we don't share. And uh, they might just be an internal document that we use for, you know, us for, in terms of thinking forward into the future. Right. Um, I, you know, I think the question was just about the template, just the kind of the bones of what you do without any of the data in there. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, we don't really have like a template, but we could we really share the, I mean, the farm report is in the farm manual. Yep. which is on the nifty. Um, so we basically, you know, we just, I think actually it, the format that it ends there. up taking really depends on the person, like, you know, the way I write a report and the way I synthesize the information is actually probably different than people who have been in my job before me. So we don't have a specific format that we, um, Got it. Uh, we're, this is Chris, we're happy to share what we have, but again, I think, frankly, based on what I saw from Jesse and um, Maggie, uh, you guys are a little bit ahead of us. I mean, I, I was impressed by that whole spider web. Um, well, that's probably not what you call it, but um, that diagram. Um, we, we, what I've done is I sketched out, I believe it's like 36 different things in like six or seven different categories that we want to, basically a farmer report card, which um, we'd sit down with a farmer, um, you know, and rank them in different areas and based on that develop like an IEP, an individual education plan, but focus on places where they have to, you know, emphasize further further development. But we've yet to implement that. Um, I want to do it this year. Um, so we're, we're like, again, this is one of those things. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's on the uh, drawing board, but we've yet to implement it. In any case, I'd be happy to share what we do have. Yeah, New Entry's been working on a tool like that as well and trying to get all the skills. And unfortunately, the challenge is there's about 50,000 things that a farmer needs to be able to do. Right, right. so how do you make it concise? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, and how do you make it so it's not completely unwieldy and accessible? I think um, that, that's the that nice thing. we've had with our farmers. It's just, um, you know, again, I'll get back to the, the cultural differences and some of the educational differences, overwhelming them with questions and, and information and and, and talking about long-term plans and business plans, we found is we've got to be very careful. Uh, it depends on the individual because some are, are quite capable and, and have thought about these things, but others haven't. So we sort of have a staged approach year by year. There are certain milestones they have to pass, pass through and certain deliverables they have to do based on their level of development if they want to continue to advance. Um, and this more gradual approach, I think, where is going to be more effective as opposed to expecting a business plan in the first year. I think most of our um, participants just aren't ready for it. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, we've just got one minute left, and I think we're going to just wrap things up. I just want to thank everybody again for coming. Um, and again, there'll be a recording of the webinar available. Um, and